Good afternoon. I'm General David Berger, Commandant of the Marine Corps, and I'm joined today by Lieutenant General Steve Rudder, the Commander of U.S. Marine Corps Forces Pacific, Lieutenant General Jody Osterman, the Commanding General, Commanding General of First, of First Marine, Marine Expeditionary, Expeditionary Force, Force. Lieutenant General, Lieutenant General Karsten Heckel, who will soon take command of one MEF and the Sergeant Major of the Marine Corps, Sergeant Major Black. Yesterday evening, an amphibious assault vehicle, or AAV, with the 15th Marine Expeditionary Unit suffered a mishap off the coast of Southern California, where the vehicle sank after taking on water. First, I'd like to thank everyone for their heartfelt condolences on behalf of our Marines, sailors, and family members affected by this tragic mishap. Let me add my own condolences and prayers to theirs and ask everyone to keep the families of these service members in their thoughts. There were 15 Marines and one sailor aboard the AAV at the time of the mishap. And as of this afternoon, we found eight Marines. One Marine has died as a result of his injuries. Two Marines remain in critical condition and are in the care of civilian medical professionals at Scripps Memorial Hospital. Five of the eight Marines rescued are back aboard their assigned ship. We still have seven Marines and one sailor who remain missing and search and rescue efforts are ongoing to find them. This mishap is under investigation and we will share the results of it once it is complete and the families have been notified. In the meantime, I've directed an immediate suspension of amphibious assault vehicle water operations until the causal factors of this mishap are better understood. All AAVs across the fleet will be inspected. Again, I'd like to offer our most heartfelt, heartfelt thoughts and prayers to the families of our Marines and sailors. And I'll turn it over now to Lieutenant General Osterman, the Commanding General of First Marine Expeditionary Force. Well, good afternoon. As the uh, Commandant mentioned, I'm uh, Lieutenant General Jody Osterman, the Commanding General of First Marine Expeditionary Force. And uh, first and foremost, I'd like to just uh, acknowledge that our thoughts and prayers are with the families affected uh, by these Marines that have been in the mishap. Very tragic situation that is part of our family here at One Meth. Uh, the incident occurred uh, just off of San Clemente Island, and uh, it was part of our amphibious training that uh, we do with the 15th Marine Expeditionary Unit, of which these uh, Marines and sailor were uh, a part of. The, uh, the operations there, as I said, were part of normal uh, waterborne training. Uh, when the AAV began to take on water, they signaled to the rest of the uh, unit that they were in fact taking on water. Immediate response was provided by two additional Amtraks that were with them, two, eight, two more amphibious assault vehicles, as well as the safety boat, which is uh, always accompanying our water operations. And as the Commandant mentioned, we were able to uh, rescue eight of the Marines uh, there, and we are still uh, continuing search operations and the uh, uh, SAR operations, if you will, for the uh, other seven Marines and sailor that uh, we have not yet found. So again, uh, our heartfelt uh, thoughts and prayers go out to the family members. And uh, with that, I'll be ready to take any questions that you might have. Sure. Yeah. The uh, basically the AAV uh, in that part of off of the islands there. For anybody that's familiar with them, the uh, water drops off very quickly. So uh, the AAV is actually in several hundred feet of water. It's uh, really below the depth that a diver can go to. And uh, so we're working, and I really owe an incredible. Uh, 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 gratitude and thanks to our Navy and our Coast Guard uh, brethren who have helped us in this endeavor. Uh, they're actually working with us to provide uh, assets that can uh, basically get down to take a look at the AAV. And then um, we are continuing search and rescue operations at this point. Uh, we have not moved into recovery operations. We're still looking for them uh, for the uh, seven, or excuse me, seven Marines and one sailor who uh, we have not yet found. So. Anyway, that's basically uh, 
I guess the, the parameters associated with that one. Uh, you know, I don't have the specifics. We, we told them, obviously, that we would like to be able to uh, see what's happening and then assess the situation. So um, they, they have a lot of technical knowledge in that realm and are going to basically figure out what the best asset is to, uh, you know, help us out in that regard. Well, they were basically completing training. They had already come ashore the, the day prior and had been conducting uh, training operations ashore as well as afloat. So they were actually on their way from the island back out to the ship. And uh, I don't know the exact distances, but uh, uh, over a thousand meters offshore, it was uh, quite a distance before you know it was noticed that they were in trouble. Out of precaution, before we understand what caused this, um, I'm pausing, we are pausing the waterborne operations for Amtrax. Once we determine what the cause was, then we'll make a second decision whether to recontinue. But this is to ensure out of an abundance of caution that we take uh, the time, give the time to the uh, recovery and find out what actually happened. So Amtrak units can continue to train ashore We'll just wait until we have a better picture of what caused this and then we'll make a second decision. We'll wait till this investigation is, is done. Uh, uh, I think all of you want the same thing. First, to make sure the families are taken care of and that the uh, search and rescue efforts go with all the support that we wanted to. And then we'll, then after the investigation is done, we'll see, as always, if there are any trends, if there's any linkages. Uh, first step, conduct a search and rescue and take care of the families. And that's what the focus is today. And sir, if I, if I could, uh, also just to clarify, it's, it's actually the last 25 years and uh, we maintain an inventory of over 800 uh, vehicles, uh, eight amphibious assault vehicles. So just to put in context uh, the two vehicles over the last 25 years. Those who have experience with these ships say once they start taking on water, it happens very quickly, depending on how many on there. Obviously, it may be more difficult to see how many can get off. Um, we talked about what the situation was on there. I, I could take that comment. Mm -hmm. Um, sure. Uh, for those who didn't hear the question, this it was pertaining to the difficulty to egress the uh, amphibious assault vehicles. The amphibious assault vehicles are built and uh, spe the specifications are they can hold 21 personnel in the back with up to 285 pounds of gear each and then they have three crew members as well. This particular AAV had a total of 16 personnel on board so it wasn't anywhere near the maximum number. And from an egress perspective, just an awful lot of uh, dynamics involved with that. Uh, with the personnel recovered, obviously some were able to egress, but as the Commandant mentioned, until the investigation is completed, we won't know all the details of you know, uh, that, that part of it. Each AAV does have three watertight hatches forward for the crew, and then it has two very large troop hatches in the back that uh, come up and open. Uh, the vehicle itself weighs 26 tons, so with that, uh, you know, and the the water and the freeboard, um, you know, it it has a, 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 a natural buoyancy to it, obviously, to be able to conduct operations. But again, depending on how much water, wave height, things like that, it you know, it's kind of a relative uh, decision about uh, how much water or anything like that it would require. Can you talk a little about? Uh, you, you mentioned the weight. Can you talk a little bit about what? You Sure. Um, 
The Marines were in their normal combat gear, so uh, their uh, the body armor, the basic uh, kit that they have with it, with them. Like I said, they had been ashore the day before as part of the operation. The uh, they all had flotation as well. That's part of our uh, equipment loadout that goes with it. It's an inflatable vest that they they wear with that. Um, with the rescue operations, some of those Marines were picked up because they were floating. Uh, so just, you know, that's about all the detail I have on the individuals. So uh, the gear, you know, for those Marines was working properly. Can you please clarify on the 1,000 meters from shore, is from the beach or from the island? Uh, it would be, it was more, it was more than 1,000 meters less than 2,000 meters from the beach on the island, uh, on the northwest uh, corner of the island was the landing beaches. And also, uh, the condition of the two injured, are they still in the hospital, or how are they doing? Uh, right now, I don't want to talk about specific medical conditions because of you know their privacy and HIPAA rules, but right now, they, uh, they are both stable, uh, and they've, uh, my understanding is that they've moved out of the uh, intensive unit to the uh, uh, the standard ICU unit, so they've been stable enough to reach that point. Thank you. Go ahead, you know, I don't have the specifics of the conditions. I do know that, uh, and something I had asked the commander about the um, the assessments, there's always a surf assessment or a wave action assessment that's done to make sure it's within the parameters uh, for the AAVs to execute just like boats or anything else. And uh, it was within the parameters that we had. Uh, I just don't, there's everything from wave height to chop to, uh, you know, a number of different factors that fall into, you know, what that calculation is. And I don't know all the details of the uh, individual pieces of the calculation is just that the overall conditions were acceptable at the time they launched. Can you talk about what assets you have currently right now assisting the search and recovery uh, surface as well as airborne and other agencies like the Coast Guard is involved? And also what support is being provided to both the crew and the families, kind of like staff members and other Sure. Um, right now, uh, on station, uh, We've got the uh, USS Essex, a large deck uh, amphibious ship, uh, the Somerset and the San Diego, which are all associated uh, with uh, the training that was going on. Uh, also a destroyer uh, that was uh, on station as well. She, she came over from a distant location uh, very quickly at uh, uh, high speed to, to get there in time. And then there's, um, f those are the surface vessels. Coast Guard Cutter was also involved. Then uh, yesterday and today, we've had uh, helicopters up 24 hours a day, um, mostly associated with the search and rescue helicopters with sensors, Coast Guard helicopter, as well as Navy helicopters, Marine Corps helicopters. And then um, uh, from a, kind of a surface perspective, the, the ARGMU has uh, 11 meter inflatable, uh, rigid hull inflatable boats. Uh, those were deployed as well. So uh, literally every asset we had that was available to search, and they continue to search during the SAR effort at this point. Did the AAV, I'm sorry. That's all right, go ahead. Did the AAV sank completely? Or it, it sank completely. It, uh, uh, basically the adjacent AAVs watched it uh, go down, and as I said, 26 tons, It, it pro the assumption is it went all the way to the bottom. Um, you know, I don't have the exact details. We we know precisely where it went down because the the other units were literally right there with it. So uh, they marked it. They know exactly where it is. Part of the search and rescue effort includes things like uh, looking at the water currents, looking at the uh, temperature of the water, the survivability of people in the water. Uh, any kind of drift. So uh, there's search and rescue as experts, which includes Coast Guard personnel that have gone to the Navy ships in order to assist with the effort. Erica, go ahead. Um, how many other AAVs were with them when this happened, and did this have anything to do with summer fury training? Uh, with what training? I'm sorry. Fury, 
Summer Fury. Um, there, my understanding is there were a total of 13 Amtraks. Yeah. Sorry. And the uh, with Summer Fury, no, it was not uh, connected to Summer Fury. That's primarily an aviation uh, uh, training uh, venue out of uh, Miramar. We have time for one more question. Um, the the age of the AAV, I don't know for that particular one. AAVs were originally procured in 1972, but they've gone through many what we call service life extension programs. So up at Barstow, they bring it in, they literally take it down to just the hull and uh, rebuild everything inside of it. And uh, with the age of that vehicle fleet, we've done that multiple times through the years to keep them uh, safe. Uh, some of the recent modifications include things like emergency lighting and those kinds of things that are included in there, you know, that would pertain to egress. And then how long did they find how long it took to go down? You know, I don't know exactly. I do know that uh, it, it was a very short time for the rescue uh, to commence on that spot because they were very close to the adjacent uh, AAVs. But, I don't have the investigation will bear out some of those details about timing and things like that. Okay. One last question. Is there any particular conditions on the ship that made it easier for those eight to be recovered quickly? Was it their location on the AAV? Uh, that part we don't know yet because um, the only thing we can really tell is the difference between who is a crew member and who is in the uh, troop compartment, but it doesn't have any, uh, you know, as far as uh, being able to get out of the vehicle or survive, uh, no real correlation between those that we know of now. And again, the investigation will bear that out a little further. Sir, the age average of the missing. Yeah. The average age? Um, I would say probably the oldest person in there was uh, early 30s. And then the youngest ones, uh, base, and I'm basing this off of rank, I don't know the particulars. Youngest Marines were. Uh, uh, probably uh, about 19, 18, 19. Uh, we had a few uh, PFCs, okay. private bird class Thank in there. Is there any closing comments from either? Sure. Yeah. Uh, I would just ask you uh, to respect, to understand the situation that the families are in and ask your help there in giving them space right now. Both the families of those that were recovered and the families who are waiting on news of theirs who are not yet accounted for, please give them the space. Um, you will get information as uh, one MEF gets it. Uh, I'm just asking you to give them the distance, put yourself in their shoes, allow them to focus on their Marine and their sailor, and then the rest of the answers will all come to you. Uh, but sometimes uh, in our eagerness to get information, we uh, lose sight of the priority. I know yours are the same. The priority right now, those families, those Marines and the sailor, that's the priority. So I'm just asking you to respect that. All the information will come as we get it, and I'll leave it back to you. Yeah, just uh, thanks for your interest and uh, for the support for One Meth here in the uh, Southern California community, and uh, appreciate you know everybody's assistance in this effort. Thank you. Thank you so much.